Okay, so we will just get started. Um, I hope you aren't tired of testing because this is also all about testing. Um, so for some background for people who might not have been here last year, Amir and I talked mainly about the new system for XFS, uh, stable testing. So previously XFS was not taking backports because they were worried about breaking things. And so we wanted to say how can we get known fixes, known bugs with known fixes into the stable branches. Um, so this developed a new structure, organization of what testing is required, who's going to be doing it, how's that going to be distributed, things like that. Um, next. No. Okay. So I sent a proposal on the list and got a lot of uh, suggestions and feedback like, from that post. So thank you everyone who replied to that and I tried to aggregate everyone's ideas and added some own ideas. But the primary te topics I wanted to cover were test runner updates, so things that I've been working on or hope to work on with GC, XFS tests, um, KDevOps, which I don't know if we really need to cover because I think there's a next session on KDevOps, um, expungelist strategy, and patch selection, which still sucks, and formalizing exactly what's required, and some config management to go along with that. All right, so. After a year of doing this, there's definitely been way more obvious what the pain points are, and a lot of it is a lot of mechanical work that can be automated. Um, so the current setup has been testing uh, like hundreds of runs on a baseline branch, and then done, doing a lot of runs on the backwards branch and just trying to compare the differences. And it's annoying because a lot of the flake rates are like between like one in 20 or one in 100. So oftentimes, unless you do a ton of testing on the baseline branch, you'll have to go and still reinvestigate all the flakes that come up, which is just like manually time consuming to compare, relaunch, 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 compare again. So at least for GC XFS tests, which is what I primarily use to test, I would like to do away with testing on the baseline branch altogether because if something is passing on the backwards branch, we don't really care if it was passing or failing before that. Um, so uh, the end goal is to uh, uh, launch on the backwards branch and GC XOSS can monitor for when it finishes and collect all the results and then if it sees any fails or flakes it can automatically relaunch that with the high run count um, on the baseline branch and then hopefully compare all the results and just output the true uh, possible new regressions. Um, KDevOps, I don't know if you want to postpone this or not but there was some comments on my proposal for um, how to share results. I'm not sure if that's how that's been going and where to store them in the separate tree or not. Um, but we can have that in the next session. And then the expunge list management. So um, lots of people who run this have their own list excluding different tests to run. And uh, I know like the different test runners will have different things and there are some suggestions to move this into FS tests, which kind of makes sense for some cases, but of course different test runners will have to exclude for different reasons. So you can't move everything into it. Um, but I think in general, like I'm not opposed to people having their different test setups, but I think when we can store some common stuff into FS tests, we should try to go that way to deduplicate things. But there was also a proposal that we try and just be more liberal with the testing of like the not run checks, which I think makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so I guess something to consider when you're writing tests is instead of just adding something to your exclude list, maybe take an extra like five minutes to, if it's testable criteria, to add it to the not run so we all can benefit from it and you can also not have to worry about forgetting that you excluded it and never enabling it again. Mm. And patch selection. So um, XFS currently does not opt into the automatic backporting. But if you could still use the CC stable and fixes tag, that would be great because that helps us find those patches a lot easier. Um, and also, last year we talked a little bit about auto sell. I don't think Sasha's here, but um, so right now XFS is excluded from auto sell, but it would be great to at least get those patches forwarded to Linux XFS or just sent to us somewhere and then we can deal with them, however, um, on our own time. Or if that's you know not feasible to do, we could also, if we can get access to it, set it up to run ourselves. And if neither of those are feasible, we could possibly try and create a bot to run on like the stable RC branch, um, which is an okay idea, but I don't know after auto sale how many patches we're gonna have to start pulling back because their issues are not applicable. Um, but that is an option. Um, could be annoying, but it's something to look into. 
and then formalizing test requirements. So currently, I run a lot of tests. I run 30 runs of the auto group on 10 different configs. So basically, in the beginning, I got a list from Derek about a bunch of the different configs he suggested running. And the 30 runs, I think, is excessive, but it was kind of to get the ball rolling and get everyone agreeing on, um, I guess, the process in general. But since things are now going well, I would like to ask if anyone opposes to cutting that down to five runs or maybe three runs. And um, I'm, a, I'm in preference of having wider spread of configs and less runs per config, just because, I mean, you still get the core code path coverage, but you also get some of these edge cases. And oftentimes, the problems that I have seen have been like hard failures, and they're very obvious. And so if we can keep you know, more configs and just trim down the runs, that would be good, too. How many times did you find the problem of the 30 runs? Maybe once. Like, I mean, from all of the backporting, yeah. So not often. Use this data to um, change, I think. I, I kind of think that once you found a bug, let's say Google's had a bug, and it happened with XFS quotas, OK, make sure that that's running at least two or three things. But some of these could be very short runs, right? Because, I mean, what the heck? It, you don't have to do the full run. You just have to do a few, right? What do you mean? Like uh, I guess what I'm getting overlay is that, or? that on some of these configs, right, you'll have to run an enormous set of tests mm -hmm. because they matter. They're super important. On some of them, they're more rarely used, but you've had a bug reported in the past, so you want to make sure there's at least a small number of tests run with that config, right? Yeah, yeah. You can definitely cut back. And But it does seem like that list there should be feedback that you get from your PMs, from your mm -hmm. support people, from you know what's actually reported. Yeah, so at Google, we haven't, we just made it GA, so we don't have too much data on that, so if other people have input on. Um... Yeah, I think a lot of this, you know, when you talk about the PMs, right, effectively it's up to each individual file system to decide what their criteria is, right? So for ext4, I am not requiring that tests be patched, uh, tests be, uh, that patches be tests before they get backported into stable. Instead, what happens is when I have time, I will do a single run of all of the ext4 configs, and I will check to see if there are any problems. And that's good enough for me, right? Now, I think XFS, because they've been burned in the past, um, at least initially, they said, yeah, you know, we need to run 30 times because there's a chance that a backport might introduce a flake. Now, I think in my experience, generally flakes happen the, when I'm actually adding patches to the you know, mainline branch and I'm doing development. And when we're doing backports into the stable trees, I've found it very unlikely that the backport will introduce a flake. Right, that's at least my experience. But again, other people have burned. And so, you know, I don't know that we here get to decide on behalf of the XFS community, right? That's actually up to the XFS folks. So maybe that's a question, you know, at the XFS BOF, uh, you know, we can let the XFS people deliberate about, you know, what they're up to. I mean, like I said, I will say that I'm happy doing one run uh, for EXT4, right? But again, you know, I, I don't get to dictate what the XFS people want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one suggestion and maybe question, like rather than, I mean, of course, it's up to the XFS community, but uh, doesn't it make sense to maybe uh, have one run of uh, debug configs enable? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you are not running this with LockTap or Kasan because you won't be able to complete oh. the runs I don't think uh, it's uh, within diff. specified time, so maybe. Uh, at least one run of LockDep and Kasan can maybe jot out more issues rather than running 30 runs is mm -hmm, just, mm -hmm. just my suggestion. Thanks. Oh, okay. yeah. I will let uh, Dave answer, but first I say whatever you do, like if you decide to change it, just post this information in the cover letter, mm -hmm. then people can say if it's wrong or not. Yeah, and I, I'm okay to even write up like a documentation page too of like this is what everyone's agreed on for um, testing. Yeah, so um, my observation from what you're running there uh, is that 
optimizing the test config should actually be data driven. So I think uh, someone mentioned, you know, trim to five runs or three runs and so on. It should, I think it was Amir said, how many failures are you getting in, in one in 30? Uh, another thing that probably should be looking at there is how much additional code coverage are you actually getting from these different configurations? Um, I mean, one of the things that we look at is that if you, you know, the difference between a 4K block size and a 1K block size, it's not actually about testing sub page, you know, block size. That's not the additional coverage that we really need there. What that does is that drives B tree depths up to five or six mm -hmm. instead of only being one or two. And so it's actually exercising all of the B tree split and merge code that doesn't get exercised in the XFS 4K situation. So the actual additional coverage that you get from each of these things is actually different to what you, you would expect. Um, and so I think that you need to look at the actual code coverage that you're getting from each of these and then compare it to say running uh, instead of the auto group which takes hours to run, the quick group. Um, from my testing and measurement, uh, the quick group gets somewhere in the order of 80% test coverage, and the auto group gets somewhere in the order of 85%. So there's not a huge increase in the, in the code coverage from the auto group. It covers a lot more corner cases, um, but the runtime, the, the additional runtime, you know, talking doubling the runtime, running the auto group over the quick group. Um, so what you might be looking at there is rather than running 30 runs of the auto group of all of those things, do you get the same code coverage by running, you know, 30 runs of the quick group mm -hmm. or 20 runs of the quick group or something of the sort like that? Um, and when you identify something that's like a flaky test that is, uh, you know, it's failing one in every 20 or something like that, try and pay attention to what groups that test is associated with because many of the flaky tests are the ones that we know are non-deterministic. They're mm -hmm. often tagged as a stress test or as a, um, a uh, log recovery test. Um, because what they're doing is they're running a non-deterministic workload like FS stress and then doing weird things like triggering a file system shutdown and then recovering and then doing more stress and then shut down and recovery and so on. And so it's exercising lots of different corner cases that very few of the other tests actually uh, um, execute. And so it may be that there are certain groups that are a subset of the auto group that run, you can run much faster and much more frequently um, with those configurations that give us somewhere in the order of an 80% code mm -hmm. coverage. Um, and so rather than just looking at it as these configs, how do we run them less often and so on, have a look at what coverage you're getting and whether you can reduce the actual number of tests that you're running to get mm -hmm. the same level of code coverage. Um, because the, the results that you get from doing that sort of analysis are often surprising. Mm -hmm. um, and so you might be able to get equivalent code coverage just by running you know, you know, four or five runs of the quick group and then a long run of the uh, log recovery test group. Mm -hmm. Um, which does all of those weird corner cases. Um, and that might knock down your test time and test overhead by not just a little bit, but, you know, half it, you know, quarter, maybe even order of magnitude lower overhead test, or uh, testing overhead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think one interesting thing uh, along those lines was uh, when we added a definition of smoke test to FS tests, which was uh, work that Derek did about, what is it, four or five tests uh, that you know, were stress tests and where you could actually control how many minutes that you would run for, or how many seconds, I remember how you do it. Yeah, right, exactly, yeah. Um, I, actually, I, maybe you did that work, it was Derek, okay. Yeah, and, and so for the smoke tests, it was run these five tests, and they were all stress tests for a total of 15 minutes is what it actually turned out to be. 
I could imagine doing something similar for the stress tests where it's like, okay, let's do all of the stress tests um, and run for a total of you know one hour or two hours. Pick some time frame, but do it in terms of time as opposed to number of test iterations. And maybe that's something that's worth thinking about. So when I'm seeing like a flaky test, that's when I go look for missing assertions or writing a more targeted torture test or look at the code coverage analysis. You, you don't really want to be in the situation of having to run 30 or X number of, of runs. That's, that's tech debt. And that. There was a really interesting point that brought back deja vu, probably from a lot of people who used to work at IBM years ago. So there used to be, remember the LTP project a 100 years ago? They were obsessive about putting posters on the wall at IBM showing the code coverage for these various tests by various components. And it was proving that their tests were successful because they were showing the improved code coverage. I've, to be honest, literally in 15 years, never seen anybody posting code coverage. But I, I, I wanted to ask a basic beginner question. I'm a file system guy. I'm not a test guy. I run tests all the time. I would love if there was a way to automate run XFS test one, OK? Run XFS test two. If it doesn't add any code coverage, throw it away. Run XFS test three. If there's more code coverage, keep it. If there's not more code, if it doesn't add, if it doesn't I, cover more code, throw it away. So only include, so create a test group that is objectively covering that, these. That's, that's like next level to me. I, I don't see much people talking about co code coverage analysis either. Uh, I've got automated code coverage analysis in, in my setup, and I don't look at it often enough, to be honest. That's. That, that should be expected, like uh, on a new patch check-in, uh, look at the code coverage analysis and then ask if there's missing tasks. Yeah, and, and by the way, I totally agree. And that's, and that's also a, a culture. EXT4 may be better than XFS or worse, who knows. I know in my world that I'm embarrassed. The Samba team, a lot of time, forces you to write a test case if they want that patch accepted. That's, and, that's uh, good. That's a very good process. An XFS test would be up to 1,000 tests now instead of 700 if we did it, that. But It really helps for, for your error paths. <laughs> because I, I used to bitch to people to write regression yeah. tests or no patch, and then I got yelled at for slowing down patches, so I stopped because I got tired of arguing. <laughs> but but I, I, I agree with that culture, because that culture where tests matter than anything else will help us file system people not like go crazy. I agree. But that the thing that bothers me is that we need to be objective about tests. If a test fixes a bug or finds a regression, keep it. If a test adds to code coverage, keep it. But a lot of the tests are just useless. Yeah. So how do we be objective about our tests? And I, I really was excited if there's a way to do code coverage analysis. Correctness tests. You know, code coverage tells you that you covered things like error paths and things like that. It doesn't actually tell you that the code operated correctly and you got the right answer. So you can't just drive it by, you know, this test didn't add any code coverage because it may not actually be, the test might be actually testing that you got the right data back. And it's not actually testing the the code, it's testing whether, you know, not testing, you know, whether we're testing error branches or things like that. It's actually testing that the functionality is operating correctly. Um, so there's a few, th few things that, you know, there's a few things there, you, you can't just drive these things by code coverage because, you know. Yeah. yeah, we've got all of that in XFS tests and XFS. So like Sysbod you're talking about. Yeah, so we, we get that coverage from, from Sysbot and with, with, with the, 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 you know, Sysbot is actually working for XFS as a regression test now. We're actually getting useful results from it and it's actually finding real regressions and real bugs. It's taken us, what, six years to get to that point with Sysbot, but now it's actually functioning as a real you know, third-party verification and regression test suite. Um, so it's actually useful now. Um, and it's separate and does things differently. We don't want to try and replicate that in XFS tests, for example. We don't, you know, it's, it's, it's not worthwhile doing that. Um, XFS tests is for what, you know, 
ver verifying correctness of file system features and so on, and not so much the, you know, random malicious uh, corruption type stuff. We do plenty of fuzzing in XFS tests and so on, but we don't try and do everything for everyone because that's just, you know, not possible. Yeah. For the NFS example or for the SMB example, the most common case that's easy to think about is in the middle of an XFS test, take down the network, bring it back up, force a reconnect. Because, you know, in the middle of the test, you could be running for an hour and have a reconnect. So those kind of things are really easy to imagine. I mean, you you could do that. You could write an FS test that actually does that. Um, you know, that's it. That's easy enough to do. Just add the infrastructure into FS test to to run a background process that bounces the uh, the network in and out all the time. Yeah, and so we do, we do that, but it's not an XFS test. It's a separate test. group. Oh, my turn. So. A lot of those things you guys were just talking about, they do exist in FS tests. You can get it to sample GCOB coverage now, which I do do. Turns out that if you actually run XFS, EXT4 and Butter and they do all the tests configurations, I think the code coverage is somewhere in the mid 80s for EXT and Butter FS. XFS is in the upper 80s. IOMAP is somewhere around like 91%, which is better than I thought it would be considering I wasn't even trying. Th th this I this I got in because Kent actually nerd sniped me a like a year and a half ago to actually figure out how much coverage we were actually getting from FS tests. I haven't done it on the level of t look at every single test to figure out which ones are adding value and which ones aren't because I don't have quite that much time in the day. But it does exist and it's less horrible than I expected it to be. As for other things like test test fleet configuration. Um, I do actually have a test fleet that does nothing but long soak tests and they run continuously for six and a half days every week until the next RC shows up. And then I kill them, rebuild the kernel after rebasing all my development trees and, and for next and whatever and restart them all. And so in, in addition to those configs, there's also that. I also used to do testing of for next before I burned out, got mad, and stopped doing it, which now means that I just have more XFS configurations and I stopped doing for next. And I never said anything about the, much about this to anybody, but if I found bugs, I did at least pass them on to everyone. Yeah, I mean, on the plus side, I didn't really find that many bugs. Because I would at least go look at the bug and then go look through my mail archives for those mailing lists to see, did someone else already complain? Oh, they did? Okay, I'm not going to bother filing a report then. Someone else already covered that. So as for the number of test runs, I actually kind of assumed you guys were running 30, 30 runs just to establish the baseline and that the number would then go way down after that. I didn't realize you were still doing 30 runs every single yeah. stable yeah. release. Because I only ever run one. <laughs> now granted, the closer you get to customers, the more times you should probably be running these things. So I agree that perhaps 30 is a bit much, but 35, so. something like that is probably good. I mean, it, at some point you hit the long, the long tail where you're not really finding any new bugs anymore and you can kind of just stop. There was a point where 30 was a, a number everyone was happy with, and so that's how 30 happened. But um, I agree, we'll cut down. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the way I run tests these days is I have a whole bunch of groups that I run every single night and collectively they take about 14 and a half hours, which is convenient for pushing my branches at the end of the day, getting a, getting a beer, going to, having dinner, going to sleep, and waking up at some point after all the insane early morning meetings, and hey, look, FS test is mostly done. But there are a, bu there are a bunch of long soap tests where I just run, I think was it, all of the online repair stress tests for 20 minutes a piece, and that takes all night. The, and then there are other VMs that simply get run everything, run dash G all in random order once at whatever the default, default time and load configs are all the way to the end. So I kind of, I had kind of wondered if, if you all actually do long soak testing with the, with the branches or is it just run the same thing 30 times and to call it good if, the, if it passes that. 
Oh, you should. It's fun. It's loads of fun. It, you can get. You can find a lot more bugs by letting the colonel do accumulated brain damage in arbitrary order. Last thing on the topic of config management. Um, in GC XFS test, we have all of our configs defined with different, uh, like in different file names, just defining the different options. Um, so I usually just go through that, but there was a suggestion that maybe we formalize those and put those into FS tests. I don't know how helpful that would be for everyone to template out and add in, like you can, you know, substitute in your own test mount, test dev, things like that. Um, but that is also an option if there's interest. One other thing about configs, which again, different test frameworks have different opinions on, which is the time it takes to run these tests is significantly driven by the size of the test and scratch devices. So, you know, some people might use five gigs, some people might use 20 gigs, some people might use, you know, 200 gigs, who knows, right? And so it's actually probably good that we have a certain amount of test diversity here, but um, when we start talking about config management and comparing how long it takes to run tests, uh, don't forget that very often that's dependent on not only the type of hardware you have access to, but the size of the test and scratch devices. <clears throat> so, a, another basic beginner question. I run into this kind of thing all the time, and one of the things that I, that, that I was kind of hoping for is that we frequently have a set of mount options that all of the test groups run. And then we want to try with quota, or we want, well, not in my example, but you know what I mean. There's, there's like, I want to add one mount option to the end of the default options. Mm -hmm. And is there a way to, like, I don't know if XFS test has this, but what I want is like base mount options, and then in, inside XFS 4K quota, append dash O quota. So is there I... a concept like that? I'm not sure. I usually go through our default, but I do know that a couple tests will actually overwrite those mount options. I don't know if that's gotten fixed, but some some like tests, if it wants to do some weird thing with the mount option, it'll just create new mount options. So there it totally won't work. I think that's only a few tests, but um, right. as yeah. far as appending. And then some of the test frameworks do have ways to make it very easy to append a mount option to the standard set, um, but I don't... I just do that manually in my test framework. It's not something where I've been messing with the FS test config infrastructure. And a lot of that is because, again, this is where test infrastructure tends to be um, very opinionated, right? Which is, you know, what mount options you want to use. For example, my exclude files, um, I actually do if def with Linux version code. So I can actually say, exclude this test if you're you know, between these two Linux versions because I know it's a known bug that we're never gonna backport to the stable kernel. So I'll, I actually do that in the exclude file. Cave DevOps has a different way of managing exclude files for different kernel versions. And yeah, I mean, I think that these are areas where we could talk about trying to centralize some of this stuff into FS tests. Um, but at the moment, there's a certain amount of it, which is our test frameworks. We, have, we each have our own workflow and our own way of dealing with those things. I think you guys really got to start thinking more about how to manage the combinatoric explosion of things to test. This is tech depth. If you've got, you're, you want your test to be self-contained. You don't need to be running every single test and different times and different configs. The vast majority of your subtests they aren't going to hit anything new when you, you test them with different configs. These should be different tests that explicitly stress the different XFS configs under test XFS and FS tests. The reality is I find problems this way. Yeah, because you're not going through and writing the specific targeted tests. Uh, I think it's more than that. Here's uh, thing, right, which is for me, Test hardware is way cheaper than software engineering time. I agree that some of this theoretically is tech debt, and if I had 10 engineers working with me to pay down the tech debt versus 
you know, 100 VMs that I can fire and run at night, one I can manage. The other is not up to me. I don't have VPs giving me that kind of headcount. So sure, I will agree that hypothetically speaking, there's a certain amount of that that in theory we could add all sorts of assertions and all sorts of specialized stuff. I'm living with what resources yes. I have. Yes. So. Yes. Let's, let's at least be realistic about what sales is about. Yeah. How many resources about sales? That's very true. Uh, you know, combinatory explosions don't scale. We've known that for a long time, but there are certain things that we do actually have to exercise because the mount options or the MakerFS options are actually modifiers to behavior. Um, and so they run the same code, but they then run through different branches in the code, such as stripe alignment and things like that. They do, they trigger different behavior from allocators. So while they're still running the same code, the value that the allocator is using is, instead of being one is now 32 or 64. And so we then have different uh, off by one bugs in the code and so on that you don't actually end up seeing if you're not testing with a aligned stripe unit or so on. So in some cases, that's actually necessary to do the combinatory explosion. But to take that example there, you've got XFS 4K and XFS quota. The XFS 4K without the quota testing is basically the same thing, you know, it covers exactly the same code as the quota testing. The only difference is, is that you get the extra quota on it. So they're actually, ex you don't need to do both of those. Mm -hmm. You can just get the same coverage with XFS quota, you know, the 4K quota option. So you do still have to be smart about the configs that you select. Um, to minimize the combinatory explosion, but we can't avoid it completely yeah, because of the, the modifier behavior that some of those things have. I can't avoid it either. I have different variants for like locked up and uh, I forget a little, but you, you don't want to be relying on that. You want to you catch as much as you can with targeted tests. So um, I'll just and finish with one, one, one last point. Uh, so the reason I think uh, we brought this config management to have like a centralized config management in FS test is that, uh, you know, uh, we have file system developers, but then we also have different file system verification team, testing verification team, support team in different companies. And so it would be good if we have a centralized config management in FS test itself, which all these different like, FS developers would like their different configurations of MKFS and mount options to be tested. And so it would be easier for everybody from their side to just test this as part of the same FS test itself. So, so if we can have some kind of common config management, it would be easier for them not to know about what kind of FS configuration do they need to go and test it, and then maybe they would already have that as part of FS test. So. That's kind of difficult when you're testing different hardware. Um, you know, stuff like you can't run DAX testing on on code on systems that don't have you know memory-based file systems. Um, so there's certain things that uh, you can do, but there's certain things that you can't do. And so even if you try and cent centralize that, everybody is going to need to have you know, their own separate configs for certain things. Mm, so that's completely okay. Like, for example, yeah. uh, a configuration option in FS test currently, we can just take, uh, like, for example, you can have a DAX configuration defined in the same file, and, and if somebody doesn't want to take DAX testing, it can just exclude them and just test the rest of the configuration. But the, but the entire uh, config is managed, centralized in FS test. So, it I, depends I still, upon I still have to I modify. Agree. I still have to modify that locally to match all of my own hardware. No, we can still code it up to just make sure that it just tests whatever uh, part of the configuration of the same file can be tested. Right? We can just make symlinks, or I mean, we can code that behavior up. It need not be uh, kind of copied over to local.config file. I mean, we can change that behavior. Is what I was suggesting. I'm not sure exactly how you envisage that to work, so maybe patches. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Thank you. I, think, I think that's it, but um, if anyone ever wants to help with XFS stable patching, um, feel free to shoot me an email, or if you're a file system looking to adopt you know, different testing procedures, I'm always happy to chat. I'll, uh